A Christmas Carol, condensed by Charles Dickens for his public readings. Molly was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Molly was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assigned, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, his sole mourner. Scrooge never painted out old Molly's name, however. There it yet stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Molly. Firm was known as Scrooge and Molly. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Molly. He answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone with Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. External heat and cold had little influence on him. No warmth could warm, no cold could chill him, no wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose, no pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him only in one respect. They often came down handsomely, and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him on the street to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. And no man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him. And when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into doorways and up the courts, and then they'd wag their tails, as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. What was the knowing ones called nuts to Scrooge? Once upon a time of all the good days of the year, upon Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting, foggy weather, and all the city clocks had just gone three, but it was quite dark already. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, and the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal, but he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room. So surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore, the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who had come upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation that Scrooge had of his approach. Bah! said Scrooge. Humbug! Christmas a humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do? Out upon Merry Christmas? What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? A time for balancing your books and having every item and through a round dozen months presented dead at you? 
I had my will, every idiot who goes out with Christmas upon his lips will be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, nephew, you keep Christmas your way and I'll keep it in mine. Keep it, but you don't keep it. Leave me alone, then. Much good it may do you, much good it has ever done you. There are many things which I might say have derived good, for which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it has come around, apart from the veneration to its sacred origin. If anything belonging to it be apart from that, as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar year where men and women seem by one consent to open up their shut hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they were really fellow travelers to the grave, and not just another race of creatures bound on their journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me some good, and will do me some good, and I say God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. You let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he said, turning to his nephew. I wonder why you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed, he did. He went the whole length of his expression and said he would see them in that extremity first. But why? cried Scrooge's nephew. Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. <laughs> because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if it were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, Uncle, you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry, with all my heart, to find you so resolute. We've never had any quarrel to which I've been a party, but I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I keep my Christmas humor to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding the clerk and letting Scrooge's nephew out had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to the list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it's more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute, who would suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds are in want of common comfort, sir. <laughs> are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons, but under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the unfolding multitude, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me of that witch, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make myself merry at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help support the prisons and the workhouses. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many people can't go there. Many people would rather die. <laughs> if they would rather die, then they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house had arrived, and with an ill will, Scrooge, dismounting from his stool, tacitly admitted that fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. It is quite convenient, sir. 
<laughs> it's not convenient and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself mightily ill-used, I'll be bound. Yes, sir. And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. <laughs> Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day off. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down the slide at the end of the lane of boys, twenty times in honor of it being Christmas Eve, and then ran home as hard as he could pelt to play at Blindman's Buff. Scrooge took out his melancholy diner in his usual melancholy tavern. And having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, he went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lower pile of buildings up a yard. The building was old enough now and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. Now it's a fact that there was nothing at all in particular about the knocker of the door of this house except that it was very large. Also that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence at that place. Also that Scrooge had very little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. And yet Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw the knocker without its undergoing any immediate process of change, not a knocker, but of Marley's face. Marley's face with a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but it looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned upon its ghostly forehead. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. He said, Poo! Poo! and closed the door with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellars below appeared to have a separate pearl of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly too, trimming his candle as he went. Up Scrooge went, not carrying a button for it being very dark. Darkness is cheap and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that it was all right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. A small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and the little saucepan of gruel. Scrooge had a cold in his head upon the hob. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing room, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber room, as usual. Old fire guard, old shoes, two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the very low fire to take his gruel. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten and with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell began to swing. Soon it rang out loudly. So did every bell in the house. This was succeeded by a clanking noise deep down as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs and then coming straight toward his door. It came on through the heavy door and a specter passed into the room before his eyes. And upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, 
I know him! Marley's ghost! That the same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked the phantom through and through, and saw it standing before him, he felt the chilling influence of its death, cold eyes, and noticed the very texture of the folded kerchief about its head and chin. He was still incredulous. How now? said Scrooge, caustic and as cold as ever. What do you want with me? Much. Molly's voice had no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down? I can. Do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair and felt that in the event of its being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality that is beyond your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his horror. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage around its head, as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Mercy, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Why do spirits walk the earth, and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I cannot tell you all I would. A very little is permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In my life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. Seven years dead and traveling all this time, you travel fast. On the wings of the wind. You might have gotten over a great quantity of ground in seven years. Oh, blind men, blind men, not to know the ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures, for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit, working kindly within its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunities misused. Yet I once was like this man. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business? cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the specter going on at this rate, 
and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, my time is nearly gone. I will, but don't be hard on me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of procuring Ebenezer. You are always a good friend to me. Thank ye. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow night when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more and look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. It walked a little backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the apparition reached it, it was wide open. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. Scrooge tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable and being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, he went straight to bed, without undressing, and fell asleep on the instant. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out his bed, he could scarcely distinguish between the transparent window from the opaque walls of the chamber, until suddenly the church clock tolled a deep, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn aside by a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child, as if like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave him the appearance of having receded from view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung around its neck and down its back, was white, as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle on it, and the tenderest of bloom was on the skin. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and in its singular contraction of that wintry emblem had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light, by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using, and its duller moments a great extinguisher for a cap, which now it held under its arm. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No. Your past. The things that you will see with me are the shadows of the things that have been. They have no consciousness of us. Scrooge then made bold to inquire what business brought him there. Your welfare. Rise and walk with me. It would have been vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes, that the bed was warm and the thermometer a long way below freezing that he was clad but lightly in his slippers and his dressing gown and nightcap, and that he had a cold upon him at that time. The grasp, though as gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made toward the window, clasped its robe in supplication. I am a mortal and liable to fall. Bear, but a touch of my hand there, said the spirit, laying it upon its heart and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood in the very busy thoroughfares of the city. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here, too, it was Christmas time. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? Was I apprenticed here? They went in at the sight of an old gentleman in a Welch wig, sitting behind a high desk, and if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. Scrooge cried in great excitement. Why, that's old Fezziwig. 
Bless his heart, old Fezziwig alive again? Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands and adjusted his capacious waistcoat and laughed all over himself from his shoes to his organ of benevolence and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, Yo! Yo there! Ebenezer! Dick! A living and moving picture of Scrooge's former self, a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow prentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. My old fellow prentice. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attracted to me. Was Dick? Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo ho, me boys, said Fezziwick. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let us have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Clear away? There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwick looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off, as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, and fuel was heaped upon the fire. And the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright as a ballroom you desired to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and turned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwick, one vast substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwicks, beaming and lovable. In came six young followers whose hearts were broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin the barker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend the milkman. In they all came one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling, and they all came anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place. New top couple starting off again. And as soon as they got there, all the top couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwick, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter especially provided for the purpose. There were more dances, and there were more forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold boy, and there were minced pies, and plenty of beer. But the great effect upon the evening came the roast and the boil, when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Curley. Then old Fezziwick stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwick, top couple too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them, three or four or twenty pairs of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they had been twice as many, four times, old Fezziwick would have been a match for them and so would Mrs. Fezziwick. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwick's calves. They shone in every bright part of the dance, and you couldn't have predicted at any time what would come of them next. And when old Fezziwick and Mrs. Fezziwick had gone through the dance, advance and retire, turn your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew and thread the needle, and back to your place, Fezziwick cut, cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his leg. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up, and Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwick took their stations, one on either side of the door, shaking hands with every person individually, as he or she went out and wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everyone had retired but the two apprentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. Small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that, 
said Scrooge, heated by the remark and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words, in looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it's impossible to add or count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it would cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What's the matter? Nothing particular. Something, I think. No, no. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick! This was not addressed to Scrooge, or to anyone whom we could see, but now produced an immediate effect, for again he saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a black dress, in whose eyes there were tears. It matters little, she said softly to Scrooge's former self. To you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can comfort you in the time to come as I have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. You fear the world too much. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you, have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I have not changed toward you. Have I ever sought release from our engagement? In words, no, never. In what then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end. If you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, even if I believed that you would choose a dowerless girl or choosing her, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. Spirit, remove me from this place. I told you that the shadows were the shadows of things that have been, said the ghost. That they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. As he struggled with the spirit, he was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further, of being in his own bedroom. He barely had time to reel in bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Scrooge awoke in his bedroom. There was no doubt about that. But it, in his own adjoining sitting room, into which he had shuffled in his slippers, attracted by a great light there, had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceilings were hung with living green that it looked like a perfect grove. The leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light, as if many little mirrors had been scattered there and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney, as if that petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time or in Marley's, or for many, many a winter season gone. Heaped upon the floor to form kind of a throne were turkeys and geese and game and brawn and great joints of meat-sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages and mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, and immense twelfth cakes, and great bowls of punch. In an easy state upon the couch, there sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in the shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and who raised it high to shed its light upon Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in, and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas presents. Come, look upon me. You have never seen the like of me before. Never. I've never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning for I am very young. My elder brothers were born these late years, pursued the phantom. I don't think I have. I am afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? 
More than 1,800. A tremendous family to provide for us, spirit. Conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learnt a lesson which is working right now. Tonight, you are to teach me. Let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told, and he held it fast. The room and its contents all vanished instantly, and they stood in the city streets upon a snowy Christmas morning. Scrooge and the ghost passed on, invisible, straight to Scrooge's clerks, and on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinklings of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself, and he pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name. And yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-room house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, brave in ribbons, which are cheap, and make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, the second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property conferred upon his son and heir, in honor of the day, into his mouth and rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable park. And now two smaller Cratchits, a boy and a girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they had smelt the goose, and it was known for their own, and basking in the luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. Whatever has got your precious father, then, said Mrs. Cratchit, and your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha won't be as late as last Christmas Day by a half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Here's, Here's Martha, Martha, mother, mother, cried the young Cratchits. Hurrah, hurrah, there's a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her. We had a great deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit down ye before the fire, my dear, and have a warm, Lord bless thee. No, this father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came Bob, the father, with at least three foot of comforter and an exclusive fringe hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes donned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas, for Tiny Tim, he bore a crutch, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking around. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming? said Bob, with a sudden declension in high spirits, for he had been Tiny Tim's blood horse all the way from the church and had come home rampant. Not coming on Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only in joke, so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him to the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tiny Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit as she rallied Bob on his credulity, and Bob hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much, and he thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped that the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant for them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and he trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. 
His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire, while Bob, turning up his cuffs as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture from a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer master peter and the two ubiquitous young cratchits went to fetch the goose which they soon returned in high procession mrs cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand in a little saucepan hissing hot master peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour miss belinda sweetened up the apple sauce martha dusted the hot plates bob took tiny tim beside him in a tiny corner of the table the two young cratchits set chairs for everyone not forgetting themselves and mounted a guard on their posts cramming their spoons into their mouths lest they should shirk for goose before their turn had come to be helped at last the dishes were set on and grace was said it was succeeded by a breathless pause as mrs cratchit looking slowly along the carving knife prepared to plunge it into the breast but when she did and when the long expected gush of stuffing issued forth one murmur of delight arose around the board and even tiny tim excited by the two young cratchits beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried hurrah bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked its tenderness and flavor size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration eked out by the apple sauce and mashed potatoes it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family indeed as mrs cratchit said with great delight serving one small atom of a bone upon the dish they hadn't ate it all at last yet every one had enough and the youngest Cratchits in particular was steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. By now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough? Suppose it should break turning out? Suppose somebody should have gone over the wall of the back yard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose? a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hollow! A great deal of steam! The pudding was out of the copper! A smell like a washing day! That was the cloth! A smell like an eating-house! And a pastry's cook next door to each other with a laundress's next door to that! That was the pudding! And in a half a minute Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed, but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball so hard and firm, blazing in half of a half of a quartern of ignited brandy, and a bedlight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, what a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, as he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said now that the weight was off her mind, and she would confess that she had her doubts about the quantity of flour everybody had something to say about it but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family any cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing at last dinner was all done and the cloth was cleared the hearth was swept and the fire made up the compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect apples and oranges were put on the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These all held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed... A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Which the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim to the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side, upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. 
Scrooge raised his head speedily upon hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of this feast. The founder of the feast indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I'd hope he'd have a good appetite for us. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, said she, on which one drinks the hearth of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. No one knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. I'll drink to his health. For your sake and the days, said Mrs. Cratchit, but not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings, which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank the last of it, but he didn't care two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which had not dispelled for a full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, from the mere relief of Scrooge the Baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, a full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at the Milner's, then told him what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a stretch, and how she meant to lie about tomorrow morning for a good long rest. Tomorrow being a holiday, she passed at home. Also, how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was, was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family, and they were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty, and Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful and pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded, they looked happier in bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting. Scrooge had his eye upon them, especially Tiny Tim at the last. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at that same nephew. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things that, while there is infection and disease and sorrow, there is nothing in this world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, laughed out lustily. He said that Christmas was a humbug, as I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it, too. More shame on him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women. They never have to do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprising-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was, all kinds of little dots about her chin that melted into one another and she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you had ever seen on any little creature's head, although she was what you might have called provoking, but satisfactory too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. Whoever suffers by his ill whims, himself always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He doesn't lose much of a dinner. 
Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges, because they had just had dinner, and, with the dessert upon the table, they were clustered round the fire by the lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't had any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper clearly had his eye on one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he had answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on the subject, whereat Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, was not the one with the roses, blushed. After tea they had some music, for they were a musical family, and knew what they were all about when they sang a glee or a catch, I can assure you, especially Topper, who would growl away in the bass like a good one, and never swell the large veins in his forehead, or get red in the face over it. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometime, and never better at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. There was a first game at Blindman's Bluff, though, and I no more believe Topper was really blinded than I believe that he had eyes in his boots, because the way he went after that plump sister in the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature. Knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping up against the piano, smothering himself among the curtains, wherever she went, went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anyone else. If you had fallen up against him as some did and stood there, he would have made a feint of endeavoring to seize you, which would have been a reply to an affront to your understanding, and would instantly sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. Ah, here's a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour, spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what. He's only answering to their questions, yes or no, as the case was. The fire of questioning to which he was exposed and elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal rather than a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London and walked the streets and wasn't made a show of and wasn't led by anyone and didn't live in a menagerie and was never killed in the market. It was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every new question that was put to him, his nephew burst into a roar of laughter that was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up from the sofa and stamp. At last, the plump sister cried out, I have found out! I know what it is, Fred! I know what it is! What is it? cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge! Which it certainly was. Admiration was the sentiment, though some objected that the reply to It's a Bear should have been Yes. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have drank to the unconscious company in an inaudible speech. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful on foreign lands, and they were close to home by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope by poverty, and it was rich in almshouse, hospital, and jail, in misery's every refuge, where vain men and his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out. He left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. Suddenly, as they stood together in an open place, the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost, but saw it no more. At last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting his eyes up beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming into the mist, along the ground toward him. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached, and when he came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the air through which the spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black, which concealed its head, its face, and its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. Am I in the presence? 
of the ghost of Christmases yet to come. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know, your purpose is to do me no good. And as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, lead on, the night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city seemed to spring up about them, but they were in the heart of it, on change, almost among the merchants. The spirit stopped beside one of the knot of businessmen, observing that the hand was pointing toward them. Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much either way. I only know he's dead. How did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows said the first with a yawn. What has he done with his money? asked a red-faced gentleman. I haven't heard, said the man with a large chin. Company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. Bye, bye. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit would attach importance to a conversation apparently so trivial. But feeling assured that it must have some hidden purpose, he set himself out to consider what was likely to be. It could scarcely be supposed to have bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost's providence was the future. He looked about in that very place for his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner, and through the clock pointed to the usual time of day being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life, and thought he hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. They left this busy scene and went to an obscure part of town, to a low shop where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and a greasy offal were bought. A gray-haired rascal of great age sat smoking his pipe. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly clad, came in too. She was closely followed by a man in faded black. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined him, they all three burst into a laugh cried she who had entered first. Let the charwoman alone be the first, cried she who had entered first. Let the laundress alone be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone be the third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance. If we haven't all three met here without meaning it, you couldn't have met in a better place. You were made free of it long ago, you know, and the other two ain't strangers. What have you got to saddle? Have a patience, Joe, and you'll see. What are the odds? What are the odds, Mrs. Dilber? said the woman. Every person has the right to take care of themselves. He always did. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. Mrs. Dilber, whose manner was remarkable for the general population, said, No, indeed, ma'am. If you wanted to keep them after you was dead, a wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he might have someone to look after him when he was struck with death instead of lying gasping out his last alone by himself. It's the truest word that was ever spoke. It's a judgment upon him. I wish it were a little heavier in judgment. I should have been. You may depend upon it, if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. Joe went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening the bundle, and dragged out a large and heavy roll of dark stuff. What do you call this? Bed curtains? Ah, bed curtains. Don't drop an oil in the blankets now. His blankets? 
Who else is there to think? He isn't likely to take cold without him. I dare say. You may look through that shirt until your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, not a threadbare in place. It's the best he had, a fine one, too. If they have wasted it by dressing him up in it. It hadn't been for me. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. Spirit, I see. I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? The scene had changed, and now he almost touched the bare, uncurtained bed. A pale light rising from the outer air fell straight upon his bed, and on it, unwatched, unwept, uncared, was the body of this plundered, unknown man. Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with a death, or this dark chamber. Spirit, spirit, will it be forever present to me? The ghost conducted him to poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, found the mother and children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as the statues in one corner, and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in needlework, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard these words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out, and as he and the spirit crossed the threshold, why did he not go in? The mother laid her work upon the table and then put her hand up to his face. The color hurts my eyes, she said. The color, ah, poor tiny Tim. They're better now. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used to these last few evenings, mother. I have known him walk with Tiny Tim on his shoulder, very fast indeed. So have I, cried Peter, often. And so have I, exclaimed another, so at all. But he was very light to carry, and Father loved him so, that it was no trouble, no trouble. And there's your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob and his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they had all tried who should help keep him the most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each child a little cheek on his face as they said, Don't mind, father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with him and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday! You went there today, then, Robert? Yes, my dear. Returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green the place is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little child. My little, little child. My little child. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart, perhaps, than they were. Spectre! said Scrooge. Something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I do not know how. Tell me what man that was with the covered face whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him to a dismal, wretched, ruinous churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed to one. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or shadows of the things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if preserved in, they must lead. But the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say, say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept toward it, trembling as he went, following the finger, and read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed? No, spirit. No, no, spirit. Hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man that I must have been but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? 
Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. For the first time, the kindred hand faltered. I will honor Christmas in my heart. I will try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me that I may sponge away this writing on the stone. Holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. And the room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. He was checked in his transport by the churches ringing out the luscious peals he had ever heard. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, no night. Clear and bright, stirring golden day. What day is today? cried Scrooge, calling down to a boy in Sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered into look about him. Hey, what's today, my fine fellow? Today is Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day? I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know the poulterers in the next street, but one at the corner? I should hope I did. An intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold that prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What, the one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. It is. Well, go and buy it. Walker! Exclaimed the boy. No, no, I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here, that I may give them direction where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did, and somehow he went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulter's man. It was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped them shot off in a minute, like sticks of sealing wax. Scrooge dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth, as he had seen them with the ghosts of Christmas present. Walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded everyone with a delightful smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three or four good-humored fellows said, Good morning, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, these were the blithiest in his ears. In the afternoon, he turned his steps toward his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. He made a dash, and he did. Your master at home, my dear, said Scrooge to the girl. Nice girl, very nice. Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room, sir, with his mistress. He knows me, said Scrooge, his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in there, my dear. Fred! Why, bless my soul, cried Fred. Who's that? It is I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in. It is a mercy that he didn't shake his arm off. He was home in five minutes. Nothing could be hardier. His niece looked just the same. So did Tarpa when he came in. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. A wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful humanity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming up late. That was the thing he had his heart set upon. And he did it. The clock struck nine, no Bob. A quarter past, no Bob. Bob was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door and his comforter too. 
He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming in here this time of day? Well, I am very sorry, sir. I'm behind my time. You are? Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. Shall not be repeated. I was making merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I am not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. And therefore... Scrooge continued, leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again. And therefore, therefore, I am going to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we'll discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Make up the fires and buy a second coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. To Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, as good a man as any good old city knew. In any good old city, town, or borough, in any good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him. And his own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with the spirits, but lived in that respect in the total abstinence principle afterwards. And it was said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed that knowledge. May it be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. The End